afternoon. We're going to go ahead and uh, uh, get started. We have a lot to cover. It's my pleasure um, to present to you today um, the state of the University Hospital's research address for 2023. And uh, Cliff and I were talking in the last couple of weeks, and we wanted to have a very strong declarative statement to start out in that the state of research is very strong at university hospitals and it's because of all of you. So congratulations. I think it is worth pointing out that academic medical centers as all of you know, have a tripartite admission, uh, mission of healing, teaching and discovering. Unfortunately, our present ranking systems focus solely on clinical activities. And it's very nice to see that when you add research and clinical metrics that UK brand finance has ranked university hospitals 25th in the world and 10th in the US. So that's a lot to be proud of. We have a ways to go, but it's very nice to have external validation of our path. We're gonna to talk today about one component of UH academics which is research to, to discover um, of our mission. And as many of you know, our vision is advancing the science of health and the art of compassion. So core to our mission and vision is in fact research. In 2016, we embarked on a strategic planning process in which we envision that UH Medical Center's working with key strategic partners, and thank you, uh, Dean Gerson, for joining us uh, today, just walked in, to engage in basic translational, clinical, and population health or health services research to impact our world. Our driving strategic plan vision statement was a next generation academic health system dedicated to accelerating, accelerating discovery, innovation and translation of scientific breakthroughs, which address unmet clinical needs and enhance the lives of our patients, our community and the world. And I hope to be able to convince you at the end of this talk that we are, we are doing that every day. So why is research important? Most of you are researchers, but we have many who are zooming in who don't understand the core importance of research in our mission. What I like to say, and Ian and I put this slide together, is research is hope. It's hope for patients with no options. It creates competitive advantage by attracting patients with cutting edge care, new drugs, new devices, and new cell-based therapies. It attracts patients. It's also a margin generator, and it's a differentiator. It improves healthcare outcomes by implementing evidence-based practices, it attracts healthcare leaders, researchers, innovators, industry partners, and trainees. It produces intellectual property. It drives philanthropy. And most important, it has very strong impact in our biomedical ecosystem. Every dollar that we receive in research or that this institution invests in research creates about $2.6 in output. So it is very, very important for our community. We have a very strong tradition of medical research and breakthroughs, starting all the way back from the founding uh, of this hospital over 150 years ago. And it again, throughout our history, it has been to bring hope to our patients. These are the key metrics for 2022. We have $177.2 million research portfolio. Our goal, our target has been, we set a base year of 2019 for Jobs Ohio that you'll hear about of 160 million. We are growing. We are exceeding our 2.5% uh, yearly CAGR, um, and we will get to 204 by 2030. I think we're well ahead of schedule. Our total sponsored research expenditures to UH directly from uh, pharma, biotech industry, and from federal agencies such as PCORI. Uh, ARC and HRSA was 88 million. It was up 24%. It is really incredible. And our indirects were up 10%. Invention disclosures up 18%. We're still the number one clinical trial site in Ohio with 3,400 active clinical trials. We have 1,000 faculty members, over 1,200 residents, 
1,800 medical students come through our doors, obviously the greatest number from our main partner, Case Western. And last year, at least if you go into PubMed and you cross everybody that we have on our faculty, uh, over 1,200 uh, peer-reviewed articles. Now, research is expensive and there's a very strong commitment to research into the academic mission at university hospitals. And here I include for you over time, support of education, faculty support, academic recruitment and retention, research and education dollars, distinctive programs, academic affiliations, and very importantly, support of our faculty through the practice plan. And what you'll see is tremendous growth from 140.7 million to 199 million in 2021. And the big jump in 2022 was of course related to a very difficult year in medicine, not only at university hospitals, but uh, throughout the country. But what did we do? UH continued to invest in its faculty, supporting them in 2022 to the tune of 106 million. So really important. We thank Chris Miller, Scott Sasser, and many other uh, leaders in that regard. Now, you cannot do research without strong uh, partnerships. And there's no question that our strongest partner is CWRU. And we have very distinctive programs with them, including the Case Comprehensive Cancer Center, the Cleveland Institute for Computational Biology, the CTSC, and many others. We have statewide um, uh, affiliations, one very importantly with Jobs Ohio, creating the Cleveland Innovation District, our new affiliation or newer strengthened affiliation with Neomed, and now very, very important global partnerships. Jonathan Stamler is here who leads the Harrington Discovery Institute in our new endeavors with Oxford Harrington for Rare Disease, our efforts with Morgan Stanley, and growing relationships with the Technion in Israel and our newest with the National Taiwan University um, uh, that is bringing medical students here. It's, I'm very proud to uh, now say that I believe we have matched five residents uh, from this Technion program uh, to UH, and it is a terrific pipeline that will be expanding. Now, one of the things that I think uh, that I'm most proud of, and I'm sure Stan would say has been a, a great success, has been our reaffiliation agreement that we sign and our joint strategic leadership committee that meets twice a month and whose goal is to recruit and retain the best and brightest to drive research. And this picture warms my heart because what you see are absolutely phenomenal individuals who have been recruited uh, now, both recruited uh, and retained. We have committed, the affiliation agreement provides for 2 million from each side or 4 million a year. We are selective. We have so far committed $11.2 million, 5.3 from UH, 5.9 from CWRU. And this includes the recruitment of true superstars that we will touch on, but also importantly, the retention of key individuals such as Amitabh, Reshmi, Alex, Andrew, and uh, Jim Basilian. So we're very proud of this effort. It is very focused. It identifies resources that are very important to make these people successful. Now, what about Jobs Ohio and the Cleveland Innovation District? This has been a terrific uh, program to drive our institutions together um, to create um, jobs and a biomedical ecosystem. The effort and the focus for University Hospital $17.5 million infusion from the state has been related to research and product innovation. And I'm very pleased to report that we are way ahead of schedule. Want to thank, obviously, Quentin Pan and Ted Technos and others for investments around the Wesley Center for Immunotherapy and new lab space uh, here in this building on Wolstein uh, 6 over um, now resulting in capital investment that exceeds our, our target of 10 million. Our research expenditure growth, as I told you, was about two and a half percent per year, is now exceeding, it was 30.2 million uh, on, a, on a projected target of only 12. We were supposed to create 235 research jobs over 10 years. We've created 326 in two years. And we very importantly, to show the strength and the commitment of our board, to this research mission, the board has invested $30 million in research and drug development, which is very important to drive us forward. 
We have strengthened our affiliation with Neomed, which is very important uh, for our workforce pipeline in primary care, pharmacy, anesthesia, and in technicians. It provides new opportunities for faculty and career development in collaborative areas, including ed education, innovation, research, faculty division, development and leadership, workforce development, and clinical activities. You see the faces of our UH leaders um, in uh, this work, and we are mirrored by leaders uh, from Neomed who are uh, online watching us uh, today uh, via Zoom. Uh, so thank you for the UH leaders participating in this. Just some key highlights of uh, investment. The Wesley Center for Immunotherapy and Wet Lab Expansion was an 8.3 million capital investment. Expansion of cell therapy uh, facility with three new ISO 7 clean rooms to advance cell therapy, nearly 6,000 square feet in new uh, wet lab research space, of course, office space, um, and a terrific director, Kuhn Van Biesen, who is so committed to growing cell therapy that he texted me just before I started to say, my clinic is so backed up, I'm going to have to watch it on the recorded version. And I said, Kuhn, you're in the right place. Stay in, stay in clinic. So a uh, really beautiful space, uh, obviously greatly indebted to Ted Technos and his tremendous care uh, to Joe Wesley, who, as many of you know, passed on. But uh, his family was so grateful that they uh, moved forward uh, with this uh, cell therapy facility. We uh, perform and complete the full spectrum of research, bench, bench to bedside and beyond. And I wanna share with you, we're gonna go around this flywheel. It's really important. Research in health systems is different than research in universities. Universities are about grant attainment and impact H index. We are about making a difference to the patient at the bedside. And you're gonna hear stories of doctors who are going from the, from the bedside to the bench and back to the bedside, really closing that loop of addressing unmet clinical need. The one thing I do wanna uh, call to mind though is when I talked about that strategic plan in 2016, we talked about focus. The medical school has focus, we have focus as well in areas of, of, of centers of excellence in cancer, cardiometabolic, brain health, rare disease, imaging, and immunity. Of course, we invest in the best science everywhere but you cannot be good in everything. And these are our leaders um, in these areas and they have been doing a phenomenal job. And as many of you know, when we get called to, we bring on a new center. So um, if you have a new uh, center of excellence that we can uh, think about, uh, please step forward. One of the key messages of today is team science and building research teams. And I wanna call out a couple of individuals who have knocked this out of the park. Peter Pronovos and Marlene Miller um, have now allowed us through successful uh, application to health systems implementation initiative through PCORI to gain access to a very limited number of uh, RFPs through PCORI. This is our fastest growing uh, portfolio, an $85 million portfolio of health services research. This is a very elite group and uh, very glad that Jory Mintz's team has cracked us into the PCORI space. Of course, we must thank uh, Grace McComsey, our leader and vice president of the Clinical Research Center who has become the PI um, of the CTSA and CTSC, um, a very uh, uh, um, fundable score. We're so proud of her for a, a $56.5 million um, renewal. We wanna thank uh, Mike Conson, who I saw walk in as well for carrying that PI banner uh, for so long. And what's nice to see is the expansion of the CTSC to now include the University of Toledo and Neomed um, as well. Really wanna call out uh, Amitav's uh, group as, as long, uh, and, uh, and uh, Professor Gouda for their 13 and a half million PPG related to pathways of injury and repair in Barrett's carcinogenesis, and importantly, renewal of the P30 grant by um, Irina and our great ophthalmology team in the visual sciences at now over $9.7 million. One of the things that's very important is your farm team, the development of the single A and the double A, and that comes from early career investigators. We are doubling down on commitment into uh, uh, attracting and recruiting and supporting young investigators. 
very pleased that Luke Rothamel, Sherwin McClellan, and Jason Brown are a new crop of K-12 clinical oncology scholars, and you see listed past scholars, and also listing really tremendous support from Stephen Carpenter, Stephanie Ford, and Sherwood McClellan uh, in their areas of uh, focus, as you see here on the slide. We will be measured um, by the young that we bring up and how we can get them from single A up into uh, the majors with, with, with bifurcated and independent funding, um, and they will uh, undoubtedly succeed. What I'd like to do now is go around the wheel and start with scientific discovery and bring back someone that we featured last year, Jordan uh, Winter, for his phenomenal discoveries in pancreatic cancer with a novel target of IDH1. But why we want to bring him back is that notion that um, Jordan was studying this in the mouse, but very importantly, has now funded a clinical trial from the Gateway Foundation and Jog and Peggy Garson using this uh, drug targeting IDH1 in actually patients with resectable pancreatic cancer. And you see follow on uh, studies in the tumor microenvironment and immune responses from Professor Wang and also uh, Jordan. Very important, going from um, the bench into the clinic with novel therapeutics. Um, Jim Reynolds and Jonathan Stamler are here. This is a very important paper. All of you who went to medical school learned um, an, about the most studied protein in all of biology, hemoglobin, that it carried two gases. It carried oxygen and it carried CO2. Well, we have two people here who have made a very important discovery that they forgot a third gas, uh, which is nitric oxide. And that nitric oxide on hemoglobin in red blood cells is one of the main determinants of tissue, tissue oxygenation. It has turned the field upside down. And we are very lucky um, to see these uh, two people here today. And I would say stay tuned because this is a rapidly prize winning field. So there are gonna be many more awards for these two individuals. Also wanna share with you some exciting discoveries from Atul Shopra. Now Atul texted me about a half hour ago to say he would not be here and he has the best excuse you pop possibly can. His wife is in labor and he is uh, with her. Um, Atul is a superstar that we recruited from Baylor in Texas who has identified a completely new class of hormones called cowdamins. He identified that a cleavage fra fragment of an extracellular matrix protein, a fibronectin called as as prosen is very, very important in the regulation of insulin uh, sensitivity, um, obesity, and uh, body uh, habitus and, and, and leanness, and has very important new roles in the, in the central nervous system in thirst, memory, and uh, anxiety, and renal function. And these, this molecule was discovered from a clinical observation in clinic with this individual who gave him permission to share this marfanoid pejeroid lipodystrophy, this incredible leanness is not normal. And he identified the hormone system that is involved in this. And the most amazing thing, this is just one of a whole new class of hormones that a tool has. A tool has antibodies to the receptor uh, for uh, aspirosin, and it is very similar to leptin biology. It will treat obesity and it will treat diabetes. And I wish he was here because we are very, very proud of his achievements. One of the greatest accomplishments um, of the last year has been the absolutely phenomenal growth of our basic imaging research um, under the leadership of Agata Axner and uh, Donna Pletcha, of course, $41.6 million in total awards since January of 2021. And um, to see this smiling face of Hollywood Squares is just absolutely incredible. The numbers of grants uh, from NIH, RSNA, cystic fibrosis, UK research is just absolutely breathtaking. And it's changing the way that we practice how we diagnose breast cancer, prostate cancer, and CNS uh, tumors. And we are so hopeful that they will continue this amazing uh, work. I wanna conclude, I think, the scientific discovery section with always the great work of Fabio Cominelli and Teresa Pizarro, uh, who the Digestive Health Center has greater than 28.3 million in research, but really focused studies now on uh, gas demon B and its role 
in um, intestinal integrity and health and its potential role in repair and regulating inflammatory bowel disease. Fabio and Teresa are also leading very important studies uh, in uh, the observation that IBD is increased in LGBTQIA patients and also that there are important sex differences in the microbiome. So great work from Fabio and his team and we look to follow that uh, over time. One final area of new, um, new models um, uh, Ken Remy through the um, um, push of our great chair and physician in chief, Bob Salata, felt it was time for some reorganization in the Department of Medicine and also um, uh, in a part of the medical school to create a new center, which we are calling Blood, Heart, Lung, and Immunology. It really combines disparate areas into a much more powerful group, fostering interdisciplinary research collaborations. Ken Remy is leading this uh, new center um, and it is really gonna, uh, he's gonna provide transformative leadership in really focusing largely on immunity and metabolism in many diseases. But the amazing thing about this in a very short period of time with support uh, through the JSLC, we have recruited four individuals, Tim Mead, James Ross, Doug Brubaker, and the latest recruit, Cody Rutledge from UPMC to join this new group uh, that will unite uh, many together. And I think it's really a, a, a tremendous um, story. Well, what about our translational research to bring these discoveries to the bedside and actually treat patients? The Harrington Discovery Institute, as many of you know, is focused on bringing therapeutics uh, to patients uh, in major disease areas and brain health in rare disease and did a great job in COVID-19. Its impact has been uh, profound with 36 companies launched, 19 medicines in the clinic, and the slide says 13 licenses to pharma but Jonathan informed me this morning that um, an amazing group from LSU that the HDI has been involved with from the very beginning all the way through phase 2B, just licensed to Takeda, a very, very powerful ASO technology for devastating neurologic disease like Huntington's and Parkinson's. And we are very excited because this company, this, this, these investigators were taken from start all the way to pharma licensing by Harrington. So congratulations, really great impact, not only in the US, but now also in the UK. Um, David Sylvan, uh, Neil Wyant, Kip Lee, and many others uh, from UH Ventures have really played a very important role in accelerating diagnostics and devices uh, into the clinic. And these are just a sample listing of their investment portfolio and companies uh, in this space. They have been very busy, 120 plus patent filings, 100 plus invention disclosures, 20 deals, and then most importantly, very important spin outs in the last year to year and a half with uh, Acus, Rightflow, Rodeo, Hemaptics, RiskLD, Colometics, Lucid, and our ureteral stent company. And of course, we're all very, very proud of Joe Willis, Sandy Markowitz. Uh, in Amitabh Chak uh, for ringing that bell at the NASDAQ when Lucid went public. So keep that up. We're very um, excited. Of course, we're all here though today to really pay a special note uh, to Ray Anders. Many of you know that Ray is um, very, very famous for implanting the first device to help Superman, Christopher Reeve, when he was paralyzed and um, uh, to really change the course for many, many patients with spinal cord injury to become ventilator uh, independent, no longer need their ventilator. And this has been a long road. It's tough. Uh, those of us who are in the drug and therapeutic space think it takes long and that devices are quicker, but it has been raised persistence that has allowed him to receive word only as of March 30th, only a few weeks ago, that the FDA granted uh, pre-market approval of the NUREX diaphragm pacing system for use in patients with spinal cord injury. Congratulations. And the stories of these individuals is really amazing. I think, you know, the two on the left uh, really are very, very touching because these were two patients who were able to go to college off a of ventilator using this diaphragmatic pacing uh, system. 
also want to call out, you know, great work we're doing outside in and inside out innovation. We have 1.5 million patients. We have a lot of x-rays and CT scans and MRIs and companies developing AI want them. And uh, Leo Bittencourt uh, was recruited uh, by Donna uh, from Brazil to bring amazing skill sets in this area to really advance Radical, which is um, our uh, platform for AI uh, technology. And one of the great uh, uh, outcomes of that was FDA clearance from AZMed of a fraction detector algorithm. And so we're very excited. We understand that AI is complex. Um, it is going to have uh, successes and going to have failures, but we're so glad that Leo is leading us in other activities um, in ACR AI validation, uh, Carpal AI, Sectra, and many other programs. So congratulations to that group. Now, clinical research is obviously extremely important because it's where these discoveries of basic and translational science hit the patients. And I can't think of a slide that is a greater testament to the power of recruitment and identifying superstars to change the course of a department and a program. Dan Spratt needs to be congratulated. He is um, a rock star from U of M who has a mission to create the number one radonic department in the country at UH. And he has gone a long way in only 16 months of recruiting almost 25 faculty. It's hard for me to keep up with all the interviews that come through my office, but to show you the impact of these amazing individuals, and I don't list the current members of the department, but I also, I'm also i listing the new recruits and the institutions that they come from and the grant funding that they are bringing with them and the productivity of 127 papers, nearly $8 million in grant funding over the next three to five years. And you see the listing of grant support that has come to us from other institutions. It's really important. And it's really I think also associated with importantly, an increase in clinical trial accrual over prior years, as you see here. So congratulations to this amazing group. And we look forward to reporting on um, a positive growth, even over this uh, in uh, the future. Ali Sade um, uh, is one of our uh, COVID heroes and he received a $12.5 million grant from the CDC with a potential add-on of over another 8 million uh, to really look at vaccine effectiveness and disparities and has uh, um, seven reporting sites and one coordinating site that you see here. And this is really, really uh, important because it begins to address something that's very important uh, to us, which is addressing disparities and inequities and looking at social determinants of health uh, in this space. Also want to uh, congratulate Rose uh, gubatuzzi Klug. Many of you know that UH was the center um, of the Diabetes Control and Complications trial. Many investigators have participated over this for many, many years. Um, Rose was awarded $7 million uh, to UH and CWRU as uh, um, ongoing funding to keep the longest running trial uh, collecting uh, data. This has been over 40 years. It's really remarkable, and it's really changed the way that we approach how tight diabetes control prevents complications. We know that now. We, it's accepted. It was not known when this trial started many years ago, and it's so glad that Rose is continuing this work. Grace, of course, leads not only the CTSC, but also very, very important efforts related to a long COVID and recover. We are one of only 15 uh, sites in, in the US. Um, obviously, uh, this um, award from NIH is to CWRU as well. UH was um, the, the first patient was, in, was enrolled here, which is really uh, terrific. Enrollment here has been in the top one or two in the country. And because of our incredible enrollment in underrepresented minorities, um, we were asked to enroll an additional 300 patients and receive a substantial increase um, uh, in payment. The other thing, which is really great, which is it's not enough to do biorepository and co collect natural history data. You want to intervene. You want to do randomized trials in this space. And it's really great that um, um, Grace is the chair of the intervention committee. So we're bringing these trials here. And I don't know how she does all of this. Um, 
she must be superwoman because she did a renewal of the CTSC and is leading Recover and our uh, Center for Clinical Research all at once. So thank you, Grace. Um, I think you, you work 18 to 20 hours a day. Also um, want to call out another great uh, bench to bedside story from uh, Alex and John and the Angie Fowler um, uh, uh, Center for uh, Adolescent and Young Adult Cancer. An incredible story of bench to bedside related uh, to um, osteosarcoma, a really, really tough disease. And um, they have um, really made fundamental observations, taken this now into the clinic. And it's really great to see um, how this has taken place through very strong academic and industry partnerships. And we look forward uh, to hearing about the results of Vactosertib in osteosarcoma. Finally, I think it is important to know that we are in the midst of a revolution, and that revolution is base correction. So those patients who have single sickle cell disease have a single mutation, and their life is forever changed by having a sickle cell disease. Uh, early, unfortunately, early mortality, pain, crises, frequent hospitalizations, uh, physical, behavioral, many, many issues. And very pleased that under the leadership of Dr. Dallas and uh, Dr. Delai, that uh, we are just one of 16 uh, centers right now that are providing a base correction for sickle cell disease with gene editing. And I think that's going to be a great, great trial. Obviously, the base correction, people say it's easy to do hematologic things first. And of course, it's not easy, but it is easier than doing solid uh, tissues. But we're very excited to be in this at a very early stage. Uh, finally, because I saw James walk in, um, we do have to talk about something that is very, very exciting. And it, it represents an incredible advertisement for the power of the National Center for Regenerative Medicine that Stan built along with the incredible discoveries of Arnie Kaplan, who discovered the MSC here, to have the only approved FDA study allowing for the use of pure stem cell injections for knee arthritis. So this is autologous MSCs uh, into um, a patient for arthritis. And James was kind enough to share a um, pre-injection and post-injection at one year MRI. And if you look on the left, Okay, this is a cardiologist interpreting this, so beware. Um, I think you see that um, cartilage is less uh, abundant and less continuous than the more um, uh, abundant cartilage in 2023. So early results, um, obviously lots to go, but very, very exciting that rigorous stem cell. This is not PRP or bone marrow in someone's office going back into you. These are MSCs that are purified, expanded, and then re-injected. Really, really exciting. And uh, we can't wait to hear uh, the final results. Now, what do you hope for? Well, growing up in Boston and um, actually walking by the editorial offices of the New England Journal, everybody's dream was to have a first author paper in New England Journal. And I think it still is for many of us who didn't get to walk by that office. And it was amazing that in one month, there were two first author New England Journal papers from university hospitals. And the first is from Amru Siraj, as you see pictured here, who published an international trial establishing that thrombectomy for large strokes was better than clot busting drugs and other medical therapies. And this trial will revolutionize how we treat stroke. And most importantly, and very um, positive for UH, is that Amru has been banging down the doors to do a follow-on study extending the time window for thrombectomy. And he will be, um, UH will be the leading coordinating site for uh, 30 sites uh, around the world and in the US. So stay tuned, but we are so proud of uh, Dr. Siraj who leads our stroke service. Of course, the second one um, is also uh, equally impactful, and that relates to the work of Mehdi Shishibur and others, our president of the Harrington Heart and Vascular Institute, who use transcatheter arterialization of deep veins in chronic limb-threatening ischemia. So many of you know that uh, amputation is a big problem in the U.S. Your mortality following amputation in that coming year is over 25% 
limb loss changes your whole life. And we have had no therapies for limb loss until this first author paper in which um, uh, these investigators were able to show that transcatheter arterialization of deep vein is safe and be, could, could be successfully performed to reduce amputation. These patients were scheduled for amputation and limbs were saved. And in an incredible story that uh, perhaps we can share with many uh, when we have uh, cocktails uh, at five is a patient saw the press release. I was telling Mike Tobin, a patient saw this press release last week. It was scheduled for amputation in Kentucky and said, I'm not going to have my leg amputated until I go to Cleveland for Dr. Shishibor. Dr. Shishibor did a procedure on him on Tuesday and the limb was saved. So congratulations, Maddie, and to that patient. Well, now we're going to go perhaps into one of the most exciting and rapidly growing spaces in our research efforts, which is research to impact the community in the world, which is health services research, health outcomes research, or some call population health research. And these are studies that, again, as I mentioned, are sponsored by HRSA and PCORI and ARC. And the first one is from Gautam Rao, a $4 million grant over four years to create a center to improve clinical diagnosis. This is very powerful and has a six institution consortium that Gautam is helping to lead. One of the things that's also nice and very important to point out, we must expand research within our nursing space. It's very important to have strong nurses doing research. And I wanna uh, compliment and congratulate Julia Blanchett, who is a, a research nurse working uh, in um, uh, Batul Hadapoglu's Obesity and Diabetes Center space, who has developed a type one diabetes financial toolkit for um, adults with uh, type one diabetes. It's really to develop and disseminate a financial and health insurance literacy literacy micro video two cut series with a community advisory board for adults with type one diabetes. This is going to change the way that we approach and treat diabetes, which is very difficult and very expensive now with a lot of monitoring devices and insulin pumps. And we're so glad that uh, she has received a $2.25 million grant from the Helmsley Charitable Trust to study this over the next uh, three years. It's also very important for us to expand our window on what influences disease. And I can think of no better than two individuals, Dr. Sanjay Rajagopalan, our chief of, of cardiology, uh, and Herman Hellerstein, chair, the chair that I once held, and Sadir El Kindi, who have taken a new look at cardiovascular disease. Sanjay is regarded as the leading expert in the US on the impacts of pollution and cardiovascular disease. He wrote a review in the New England Journal on that in Dr. Brownwell's chapter in his latest uh, textbook. They are incorporating over 156 variables. We'll start with this, over 155 social and environmental variables to really gain insights into the pathogenesis of cardiovascular disease. And I wanna share with you because it's incredibly powerful it's, it's the power of, um, in some regards, uh, machine learning and, um, and, and AI to look at many, many variables that are collected by large data sets around the country. And as you can see here in this map of Northeast Ohio, you can identify three population clusters that have differential CV risk. Cluster one that you see uh, located um, has high pollution, High social, high social vulnerability and low green space. It has a 61% increase in M of M MI and a 28% increase in heart failure. Cluster two, very interesting neighborhoods in cluster two, has high ozone, low pollution and otherwise, and very low health insurance and has an 88% increase in stroke. And then as we know, and, and very problematic, uh, good for those who live in cluster three, Cluster three, as he and I were talking, is Solon and other surrounding suburbs that has low air pollution burden, high health insurance, high green space, and low social vulnerability, and has a much lower risk of cardiovascular disease. And this is independent, independent 
of calcium score and all traditional risk factors. So we're really working now and focusing on 2.5 micron pollution, deforestation, increased temperature, inability to exercise as part of an $18.5 million grant looking at social determinants of cardiovascular disease. It's really phenomenal, phenomenal work. Well, I love this picture of Francoise and Jeff because you can see how happy they are <laughs> about the amazing work that they're doing in the whole health research space. A $3.15 million grant from the Prentice Foundation to do some miraculous things. And I think nothing warms your heart more than to see this study from Sam Rogers and David Miller related to the benefits of massage therapy in children providing uh, clinical benefit, ameliorating pain, stress, and anxiety in children's and teens and young adults with cancers and blood disorders. This is one of the very, very few whole health programs in a pediatric hospital, which is showing that the reductions in anxiety and pain that take away the need for narcotics and opi opioids is real. It's very real. And we're so proud of their work and hope that they will can continue it. Well, finally, to uh, conclude in this space is our new Center for Health Services Research. This is a joint effort uh, with uh, the School of Medicine. Um, Stan and I are very, very proud of being able to uh, try to expand efforts related to health equity, population and community health, methodologic excellence, primary and chronic care delivery, patient and family experience, um, and as well as training and education. This is really important because this is the fastest growing portfolio of, of, of grants and attainment and money that we have right now. When we started the idea of a strategic plan in the health services space, when Manat Consulting came, we had a $25 million portfolio. That portfolio 16 months later is now 85 million. And the money that is available in Percori, ARC, um, and HRSA is amazing. And it was spurred on obviously by the pandemic and by the fact that we're facing bankruptcy of Medicare and we need to be smarter. We need to practice with value and those funds are available to investigate that. We are presently searching for a national director and Marlene Miller led that strategic planning process and is leading that search. And we're very hopeful that uh, that will conclude soon. Well, what's this all about for our faculty? It's all of you that do this research. And of course, we're very proud of you that 52 were uh, promoted in uh, last year and were celebrated uh, together. And I think that George's comments at that, it's very nice. We invite people who are promoted to speak um, about what promotion means. And I think George hit the nail on the head. George is I think perhaps um, the bit, one of the busiest um, surgeons in the entire health system and certainly in orthopedics is an orthopedic trauma surgeon. And he, wrote, he, he said, and we, we write down from his talk, academic medicine is not self-promoting and rising to the top. Acad academic medicine is about lifelong learning, discovery, innovation, excellence in patient care, collaboration, and investing in the future. It's really, he really hit it on the head. And I think one of the things that we learn by having these individuals speak is how inspiring it is to hear them, how they've been driven, because it isn't easy to get promoted. And it's really great to celebrate them and hear about them. And these are all of the faculty uh, who were promoted. Now, some special recognitions for some special prizes. Uh, Gautam Rao for being appointed to the U.S. Prevention Service Task Force. This is a tremendous honor. It's one of the highest honors in identifying what we do as physicians in hospitals. Is it actually beneficial to patients? So congratulations, Gautam. David Wald and uh, Henry Boom were elected into the most prestigious um, physician scientist societies, uh, David into the SCI uh, and Henry uh, into the AAP. Congratulations to both of them. And then of course, congratulations to Dr. Voos for receiving the Arthur C. Reddig Award for Academic Excellence in Research. Um, you blew away everybody at the Combine and uh, we look forward to um, repeat honors because um, uh, you have great people backing uh, you up here. Um, this is the Cracker Jack uh, Research and Education Institute team. There are a lot of people who work hard to get this done. And um, this is uh, in the 16 years that I've been here, 
this is one of the most effective teams that I've uh, worked around. Uh, the trust, the confidence, the dependability, the accessibility, uh, the free communication, and the ability to work together makes coming to work every day a joy. Now, another area that's really important, it's all about the money. And uh, we need help getting it. And I do want to call out uh, Jory Mintz and her team, Frank, Abby, Sally, Eleanor, Margaret, Thea, and Madison, because this has been a very intentional effort on generating a corporate foundation and government team, including now grant writers. You can't get $85 million without people working really, really hard. As many of you know, I like to say, the grant that I write is 12 pages. The grant that we turn in is 100. And there are a lot of people working to get that other information to make sure you can get that grant. And as you can see here, the attainment that's listed here, 35 million by this team in 2022 is really incredible. So thank you for everything that you do. We also have to get the word out. So it's nice that we see that it is getting out and we have completely changed the way that we communicate through social media and marketing. And we really wanna obviously thank Ted Keegan and his team, but also those that are listed here, Yee Fritz, Lisa Hackle, Nicole Bollinger, Abigail Zona, and Shelly Parkhurst. Website, web traffic, social media, uh, podcasts, you name it, we're into it. And in fact, from two to three today, I taped a podcast with Alejandro Rivas on cochlear implants. And so we go right up until this talk to make sure we're getting stuff out for people. And um, obviously I wanna point out that none of this presentation would have been possible without Yi. So Yi, thank you very much for your help um, today. This is, um, we think it's very, very important to have as many pictures as we can, but getting it into a good presentation is not easy. So where are we looking ahead to? Um, our health service research director search uh, and implementation of our strategic plan is extremely important. We have a lot to do in that space. We want to continue recruitment of diverse faculty to promote team science through collaborative and interdisciplinary efforts. I hope that you saw from the pictures today that we have had very intentional recruitment efforts. The JSLC advanced three packages for underrepresented minority faculty. And those packages are very generous. It is a very competitive space and we must, must increase the diversity within our research uh, team. And then uh, finally, we wanna augment revenue streams for academic activities. Of course, we have to grow the NIH portfolio. That's a given and we are certainly doing it, but we also have to advance fund foundational, I mean, funding from AHRQ, PCORI, HRSA and the CDC because the funds are so rich foundation in industry grant support, which will help generate indirects. IP and commercialization is really important because eventually, as the board says to me, and as my boss, Cliff says, who's here today, we got to get this to be more self-sustaining, right? It's got to be more self-sustaining. And we're hopeful that royalty and equity streams will eventually one day do it. I, there's a just one aside, one story where I was asked to join our commercialization program um, advisory committee at Partners. And at those days, the meetings were in the Prudential Center. And I'm there with Dr. Brownwald and all the leaders, Sam Thier, and in walks someone with jeans, a flannel shirt and Birkenstocks. And I leaned over to somebody and I said, who's that guy dressed like that? And they said, oh, you don't know who that is. And I said, no, I said, well, that's the the discoverer of the technology for Enbrel, and he brings in $64 million a year. He can wear whatever he wants. So we've, you know, those are once in a lifetime um, commercialization returns to an institution, but we need and we will do better. And with that, oof, one second. Um, it takes a team. Um, we have 11 minutes to drink, so we're going to cut short quickly, but we do have time for questions. We have people online who are zooming in. This will be recorded. Urge you for those who couldn't come or your departments. People say, oh, wow, I didn't know we were doing that. 
this will be available in a recorded form that you know you can watch it at your leisure. But happy to take any questions or comments. Okay, well then let's get to drink. Thank you.